So I know you guys know a lot about fish and you know, I, although I do fish, I don't really consider myself at all an expert on things related to fishing. And most of my fishing is not trout or fly fishing at all. It's, you know, just a regular rod and, oops, sorry, and um, ah, doesn't want to stop. Um, and really most of my fishing in the, the bit of fishing I do do is, 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 is jackfish, northern pike. So where I grew up, they're called jackfish. I know that's not what they really are, but so I'm not a, I'm not, I, and I haven't, I don't, I get to fish once or twice a year. So I would like to understand though, of those of you that are here today, cause we knew that we might um, uh, have a few other guests here. Cause um, when I checked, checked with Bill and Ken, it was fine to share this invite. So we also put it on our social media. So please click on the, description that best fits you and why you're here tonight to, you know, to participate. So once you click on it, just hit submit and uh, on the poll that you should be seeing on your screen, I'm assuming. And um, once you've done that, we'll move, move forward. Not sure why the, why my, my, my um, screen's jumping for some reason. So Ken, I'm not actually seeing, has anybody answered the poll? Yeah, we've got uh, nine out of 14 have answered so far. Okay, good. Cause I'm, it's showing zero for me. So that's good that you can, you're seeing it. Good, good. So um, I think that's probably good. I imagine people either aren't able or are deciding maybe not to, plus myself and Angie would count in there as not filling it in. We're not going to fill it in for ourselves. So just wanted to get a sense. Um, can you sh sh um, close it and, sub and show, show us who's here today? So everybody says they're an angler, uh, sorry, an angler. Um, and, and that's the main reason you're here tonight. So um, I'm probably not going to be able to like share a huge amount of fish expertise that you guys don't already have, but I hope to share riparian expertise, um, which maybe uh, you're not totally familiar with all of it and, and talk about both sort of riparian areas, riparian health and, um, and some of the work that we do as an organization as well, Angie. So um, I, I'm assuming you all know what the word riparian means probably, but just in case you don't or so that we're all on the same page, um, it's really that transition zone be between the aquatic um, which is where the fish live, and the upland, which is the drier zone. So it's that moist area of extra moist soils and influenced by the, by the water body. And it can be a stream, but it can also be in an adjacent to a lake or river or wetland. And unfortunately, it doesn't want to, no, it, it doesn't want to go, there we go. So it's that extra um, moist soils where there's that elevated water table uh, and the roots that are growing into that zone from the plants um, are tapping into that extra moisture. So riparian areas and obviously sometimes the water bodies they're associated with can be really messy. Um, as the picture on the left shows, that's a natural part of the system. And the pieces on the land, in this case, the logs and the leaf material, of course, from the riparian area are often contributing to the aquatic habitat. Riparian areas also can be dry. Um, there aren't too many fish in the pictures on the right, I'm pretty sure, but maybe at times there might be, you know, intermittent ponds and pools separated and some of our drier water bodies, but riparian areas are really um, any place where that vegetation is responding to the extra moisture in different soils. So sometimes they can have no standing water too. Not too many fish in those kinds of uh, water bodies, obviously. So Water, of course, has a lot of horsepower as it flows and flows downhill, even wave action in lakes, of course, and wetlands too. But as it flows and creates energy, um, it can do work. And the faster it goes, the more work it can do. And that's typically erosion. Um, if it's going twice as fast, it can do four times as much work and carry 64 times as much material. So um, it's really um, important. And when you think about riparian management, to think about how do we, um, think about to change or influence that erosive power. If we take away all the bends and the meanders in the streams and the rivers, if we take away the vegetation, like the picture on the right, the water races and goes faster and can do all that work. On the other hand, if it's, you know, a very meandering winding system, it's got more length to it. And it's also therefore got a lot less horsepower as well. If it 
um, has excess horsepower, excess energy, of course, that erosive power can carve sideways and it cause erosion sideways, but it can also carve down and remove the channel bed deeper. Uh, and um, obviously, uh, we have a tendency to, as people, to want to slow that erosion down and we throw big rocks in to try and slow it down. But you can see in this site that the channel bottom has become what we call incised or downcut um, very extensively. Sometimes um, it's not a you know, not extra horsepower necessarily that's cutting down, but it's spreading out wide because there's lots of water in a flood situation and all that extra energy is, is getting onto the floodplain, which is kind of like the release valve. The floodplain is actually a really, really critical piece of streams and rivers um, because that is the place that that extra energy and material like sediment gets dissipated. So although we tend to think as floods is kind of four letter words, they're really integral parts of healthy um, riparian areas and stream and river systems. Um, it's just that sometimes we are in the wrong place and our stuff is in the wrong place that that can obviously pose lots of challenges. When the water does slow down, when those plants um, trap and filter, of course that helps give us better water quality, which is not only good for drinking, but of course, rather important for aquatic habitat like fish um, and other organisms need. We don't usually see it, but another really important thing that riparian areas do is they store water. By having water slow down and soak in, whether it's from flood water or runoff or snow melt, um, that water gets into the shallow groundwater, uh, into the soil pores, and into the alluvial aquifer, that those gravels that are maybe hidden in the stream bank and, and floodplain. And, and that's the natural storage of riparian areas. You often hear the, the concept too of wetlands as sponges. Riparian areas are, you know, are those sponges. And then in late season, when it's drier, there's not runoff, there's not snow melt, um, it's fall, it's winter, that water then can move back into the channel. Um, but if you don't store it, then it's not there to come back in later. And that's sort of what the right-hand side of this picture is showing, is if you you know, put less money in the bank or less water in the bank, uh, it won't be there for re a return for later. Riparian areas are of course important for fish and 80% of wildlife uh, re rely on them. So in, Al in Alberta, the, the kind of larger, the, the species that we would typically consider wildlife, so I'm not counting insects, but they, they are wildlife, but 80% of them rely on this teeny piece of the landscape, which, you know, in the Edmonton area is probably five, you know, maybe 5% of the landscape at best, and in the prairies, it's 2% of the landscape is riparian. So a really small piece of the landscape, but really important connecting corridors, important for lots of uh, both fish and wildlife. We often, um, forget how important the piece that's annexed to the water is, that land and water connection. And they're also important for other reasons. Um, from a functional perspective, riparian areas are, are highly productive because they have extra water and deep rich soils. So they tend to produce a lot of primary productivity, which for agriculture is important and grazing. They're incredibly important places for recreation and fun, all those kinds of good things that we like to do in riparian areas as well. If um, a healthy riparian area is in place, it can do all those things I talked about, all those functions. And it's those functions that then give us opportunities to enjoy, um, to get, gain ecological goods and services, economic value, aesthetic value, fishing opportunities in the future. If we, you know, make land use or land management choices, we can really change how riparian areas look. So if you, the picture on the left, uh, shows um, a system kind of in kind of in Angie's country, Rocky Mountain House, Caroline area. Um, you can really see how on the bottom part of that photo on the left, it looks like the riparian area is not nearly so wide as it is towards the top. And that's, um, you know, where you have a lot of those low muskeggy, boggy type areas. And the riparian area is extremely wide. Um, but, you know, with land management choices, we can make them look very different. And, and that's true of the, the landscape on the right as well. Um, our land choices um, do influence how the landscape looks and therefore how it functions as well. So you guys had asked us to talk a little bit about like what constitutes riparian health and what does it look like or how do you determine it? So um, I'm going to spend a couple minutes giving you a really a simplistic version in a presentation format. Hopefully someday maybe we could do a field day with you guys and go out and actually do a hands-on session um, outdoors, not when it's winter, obviously. Um, 
but it's kind of about tuning your eyes. What does health look like? So um, the top left picture shows a bunch of roots um, in a stream bank. Um, and that is really um, looking for the right pieces, the natural rebar that needs to be present. The middle picture is about looking for um, that trapping of sediment, the functional, can the, can the site function? Well, that mud in the middle picture is what we would call good mud. That, you know, it's been trapped, it's rebuilding the banks, it's not in the channel anymore, which is great for um, the aquatic and the fish habitat. Um, and it will form, you know, the basis of new bank, bank material and grow new plants. So um, it's just about tuning your eyes of like what's I'll say good or bad isn't what we're looking for. We're looking for function. So those are the kinds of things we're um, trying to tune your eyes for. The bottom picture, um, I'm sure many of you recognize that nice, pretty, purpley pink flower. It's it might be a pretty flower for some people, but it's a you know a Canada thistle. It's a weed, and we don't want those kinds of things in riparian areas because they don't have deep binding roots. They don't provide the structural integrity that natural plants like willows um, and deep rooted grasses would normally provide. So it's about tuning your eyes to the right kinds of things that make up riparian health. And we have a field workbook that we use. We have a more simplified version, which has a checklist of yeses and nos. And uh, we do a, ourselves, our own staff, we do a very much more detailed version. So I'm going to give you the, you know, the, the highlights of the health assessment. So you get a bit of a sense of some of the things um, to look for that are included in, and in the work that we do. So the first thing we look at is, you know, is the site covered with vegetation? And, um, you know, plants are an important part of doing those functions that I talked about. And of course, if there's a lack of plants, then, you know, it's not able to filter and trap and resist erosion, all those kinds of things that I mentioned. Invasive plants um, are part of that um, picture as well Is how are they spread out? How, you know, what's the cover of the area of invasive plants. Some examples are shown here with the Canada thistle, uh, oxide daisy, um, toad flax, um, common tansy. Those are some common examples that are included in this group. And the next kind of group of plants that we look at is how much of the site is covered by these disturbance caused undesirable herbaceous species. If your site is mostly covered by clover, Kentucky bluegrass, which is your lawn grass, dandelions, it's not gonna perform that many functions compared to if it's all willows and deep rooted grasses. So um, kind of important to have the right kind of plants in addition to plants in general. And most riparian areas, certainly most streams and rivers do have trees and shrubs. And we're you know, interested in knowing, are they regenerating? Are there seedlings and saplings? Um, so that you know, as old ones, fall down, disappear, die, there's something to replace them. Just like a, a healthy human community, you need age class structure, you need babies, teenagers, mature people. Um, same thing in trees and shrubs. Um, if you don't have them, um, there's there's probably something, you know, happening there to prevent that regeneration from occurring. So you need those babies to start to become old and, and you need everything in between. And trees and shrubs generally, are the things we're looking for for deep binding roots. Um, some other small stream systems, of course, can get by with other deep rooted plants that aren't woody plants, um, for sure. But in general, we're looking for a lot of things like willows and poplars um, to hold the banks together to provide kind of that structural integrity, um, as well as habitat and filtering and, and buffering and all, all those other good things that I mentioned. Um, this question, along with some of the others, are only asked on streams and rivers. We do have slightly different questions for the wetland and lake health assessment, but I'm not I'm not really covering that tonight just because of there's a little bit of difference in, in the questions, but the same general concepts apply. You can see on the right hand side there, there's a bunch of riprap, big rocks that have been dumped in on the on a river bank. And um, in front of them, there's some uh, sandbar willow growing and the sandbar willows certainly do count as deep binding roots and, and good habitat, but uh, riprap, the rocks there, do not count as deep binding roots. Clearly, they're not rooted. And um, riprap is, you know, as, as a fisheries biologist friend of mine, Lauren Fitch, who some of you know, has said to me, riprap that it is, is just waiting to fail. It always fails. If you can find a rock bigger than it in the river, that means that size of rock moves in that river. So if you have a rock the size of a house in that river, it can move rocks that big. So, um, and we never put big enough or enough rocks, they'll always move at some point in the future. So if we can 
instead encourage the right kind of vegetation and promote it, um, give it that opportunity to be there. It, it's resilient, it regrows, uh, it bends with the wind and it bends with the water. Um, so, um, and obviously provides a lot of habitat opportunities, both for aquatic organisms like fish, but also habitat on the terrestrial side as well. In comparison um, to the picture down below at the bottom there, where you have a peeling sort of sod layer, uh, which clearly is not deep binding roots either. We also look for things like human caused bare ground, how much of the site is um, exposed soil, it erodes, it clearly contributes negatively to water quality and sediment, that sediment is not good for fish gills for spawning. It's not good for water quality generally. So, you know, again, how much of the site is, is bare ground? Um, in addition to bare ground, sometimes we've altered the shape of a site, we've compacted it, we've recontoured it maybe on purpose or just through the heavy activities and use, um, whether that's recreation or agriculture or any other kind of human activity that um, basically is poorly managed and poorly planned. And those alterations could be on the bank, but they can also be in the rest of the riparian area. And over time, basically, the issue here is not only they, they often are associated with bare soil, but they're associated with um, changing erosive power, they change the shape and the contour and they result in compaction. So compacted soils don't store as much water, they can't grow the same kind of plants. And, um, and so you change the, the ecosystem integrity and the ability of that site to perform the same functions. The picture on the top left there is actually along the North Saskatchewan River, I think in, I want to say it's in Horlack or somewhere there, um, in many years ago, just walking along the river. So, and that's just foot, that's just foot traffic in the city. Um, you know, so any kind of human activity when it's intensive can, can cause Im impacts. The last parameter we look at for riparian health is, is the stream able to get up and out of its flood or onto its floodplain from the channel? So is the channel incised? I showed that picture early on um, and talked about how erosion, erosion can happen. And sometimes that erosion is sideways. So the stream moves sideways and erodes sideways, but sometimes that happens horizontally and vertically or, or just vertically. And in the bottom picture, you can see that again, it eroded the bottom of the channel um, and that caused the water to not be able to get up and out. That tiny little stream generally cannot get up and out onto its floodplain. And what happens then is you essentially make the riparian area high and dry. Um, it becomes disconnected. You don't have that release valve opportunity, but you don't have that watering and rich um, abundant opportunity for moisture and soil and therefore productivity. Um, the picture on the top um, is a site where you just have to add a little bit of water and it spreads out all over the place. Um, kind of a really low um, meandering prairie or foothill stream that's fairly flat. Um, and th in that case, it's not in size. The water can easily access um, the floodplain with, a, a, with not much extra water being added on, on a regular basis. When you look at all of those things together with obviously we do a lot more specific details in the actual field method we do, um, you score it and you score it um, in three categories. It's either healthy when you add up all those scores, which means that it's performing the functions I talked about. It's healthy, but with some problems. Um, so maybe some of the things that it should be able to do are impaired and it's um, got some issues um, or it's unhealthy and probably almost none of those functions are happening or they're all very impaired um, and, and it's not able to do the things it's, it should be able to do from a functional perspective. So it's really important from our perspective to recognize that better riparian health starts with basic awareness and education. And a part of that is about stewardship. So stewardship is really made up of awareness or that sense of knowledge and ecological literacy uh, ethics, which is a sense of ownership or uh, responsibility and action, like putting that sense of responsibility and knowledge into, you know, into practice. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we do, some examples of some of the work we do um, uh, across Alberta. And um, we try to do that in the context of the cows and fish process, which is 
kind of a way of thinking or a way of doing work. So really trying to build awareness or knowledge, work with other partners and team buildings. Um, tool building is really trying to sort of solve problems, identify options and alternatives of different ways of managing or using the land and community-based action is helping people, groups and organizations and landowners put those tools or techniques into practice. And monitoring is, like it says, monitoring the effectiveness of our work. So program evaluation, but also riparian health. So ecological monitoring. So are we having an impact and are things improving? So I just wanna kind of give you some of the examples of the kinds of work that we do in, those, in the, that context. So our awareness is a big, Big part of what we do tonight is a, a presentation, an awareness presentation, obviously, for you guys. Um, last year, these are the numbers from our, our last um, full year of work. Um, we did over, uh, we did 143 presentations to over 3,300 people, 23 field activities. Um, of course, a lot of the work we did last year was on Zoom or equivalent because um, of COVID. Um, so it was a lot less than our usual. Most years, we we're doing closer to 200, 250 events and activities that are extension based, but um, outreach was a little more constrained with COVID, of course, the last two years. So um, it's also about just bringing together information and, and trying to help people think about how does um, management, what are the principles of land management or land use that are relevant for cows, for fish? For cows, the four grazing principles are make sure you're balancing supply and demand, have appropriate distribution, timing and rest is provided which are really interrelated tightly with what fish need. Those things are ensuring that there's a reduced amount of sediment. For, for most of our fish, we don't want lots of sediment in the water, obviously in Alberta. Um, you provide cover, shade, and structure by having the right kind of management of the riparian area and adequate water, which is of course something that fish needs. Uh, water is kind of integral to fish success. It's also about working with partners to share this information to build um, collaborative projects and activities. Um, as this cartoon says, it's we complete each other. It's finding partners who each bring different things to the table, who have, um, you know, can gap, fill gaps that the others don't have, the ability to do open doors, uh, reach new people, um, and of course, increase our collective impact. And, you know, working with folks like you guys, um, you know, I think when we had your club speak last year on the native trout workshop. That's one of the ways of sharing our collective expertise. You know, like I said, we're, we're not fish experts. We're riparian, that's our focus, right? But we need to work together because all of these things are interconnected. I did want to give you a heads up that the Native Trout Collaborative, which um, is the group of organizations shown on the slide here, um, uh, one of which we are a member, um, are hoping to launch our, a new website next week, um, which will be kind of like a hub uh, website. There'll be a little bit of new specific content developed for it. Um, there'll be some videos, um, some, but it's particularly going to be a hub. So rather than creating or pulling everybody's material together, it'll be a way to go to there and find out things about native trout. So um, it'll have connections and opportunities to reach each of the different organizations and their, um, their resources, for instance. So we are working as part of the Native Trout Collaborative on a bunch of work in the Eastern Slopes. So it is Native Trout Habitat specific, of course, but um, you know, that's including the communications aspects as well as restoration and monitoring work that um, this group of organizations is doing with federal dollars. We're always working with other partners to develop, develop, develop tools as well as things we develop on our own. Last year, we did a, a bunch of a webinars on res regulations related to riparian areas and their use with the Environmental Law Center. We work a lot with uh, Mistaki, what you might know have the Mistakis Institute um, on beaver coexistence. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, and, you know, that includes things like build, we've been including and building new videos on how, what does riparian health look like? How would I assess it from a video perspective? So all of those things uh, are on our website as well as on our YouTube channel. And we are often trying to figure out or validate riparian health. In concept, I'm sure most of you could say, well, it's pretty obvious, you know, that you need plants on the stream bank to make it a healthier riparian area. That's probably obvious that it's healthier if it has them and if, versus if it doesn't have any. But um, 
how do you actually correlate that with fish, for instance, or birds or forage, of which we've done as well. And so a number of years ago, we actually um, gathered together fish data that um, the ACA, Alberta Conservation Association and Fish and Wildlife had gathered um, on some foothill streams and we did the riparian health work and we had a consultant basically work put it put all that together so put the fish data with the riparian health data and and what we found was that it's um, significantly um, there's significantly more sport fish in healthy riparian areas or really it's streams with healthy riparian areas than um, than unhealthy which which makes sense I mean you know, it's uh, it's obvious that that should be the case, but it's good to actually be able to validate that that is true. When it comes to looking at all fish combi combined, however, um, there wasn't a significant um, difference in the health categories and um, and more fish. And that's probably because things like suckers, some of the minnows and other small um, non-sport fish um, are just more tolerant and have or have a wider diversity a bit of habitats that they can um, persist in, even if the riparian area is perhaps unhealthy still. And that, that report is on our, our website under our technical report series, if you're interested. We're also hoping, and, and I will send it out to you guys, we'll be sending it out to lots of people once it's fully done. We have in a, it's sort of a draft beta version as of the summer. Some of you might have seen our riparian health assessment app, but we are, we had a lot more testing and improvements to do. So hopefully it's gonna be launched kind of more officially here soon. Um, and you'll be able to um, use it when you're out and if you wanna understand if a site is healthy. And um, we're also um, really trying to use the land and how the landscape functions to help heal places. So this is um, a couple pictures showing a Zuni bowl and a log step down that where these are, these are head cuts. So deep ruts that are basically flowing off the land and into or adjacent to water bodies. And so um, a technique to heal them basically is let the natural erosion that's happening fill in those healing spots and, and obviously try and reduce the erosion reaching water bodies in that soil, keep it, keep it on the land. So that's just an example of some projects that um, we're trying to bring those kinds of techniques to uh, tell, get them used more in Alberta. They're used, this is used really widely in the Southern US actually a lot. We also do a lot of work um, with landowners um, in general in terms of management um, ideas and advice, but some of those um, sites that we work with landowners on and land managers on become demonstration sites to try things out, to test, to showcase, to learn from and, and to share, um, whether it's offsite watering systems with livestock producers, um, beaver coexistence techniques like pond levelers to reduce the flooding impacts, but yet keep the beaver dam in place. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that right now, because I think one of the things that, you know, we often don't, um, you know, historically, we, we've been in the last 100 years getting rid of a lot of beavers or a lot of parts of Alberta, um, actually beavers were trapped out of before most of settlement happened. Um, and actually in the 19 uh 1950s i believe um edmonton actually the city had quite a lot of uh, i'll say excess beavers and they were concerned about them and they um many of the surrounding landscapes had had essentially no beavers because they'd been trapped out in the late 1800s and the beavers from edmonton were actually were released in the 50s i believe in the blackfoot cooking lake um, or i should say reintroduced because there obviously historically had been lots of beavers there but um and put back in after a long absence, essentially. Um, so uh, beavers are part of a landscape that evolved here, of course, but they do also cause a lot of consternation because they tend to be busy beavers <laughs> and do things that beavers do, like plug, plug things, flood things, and cut down trees we don't necessarily want them to do. So, um, but they are integral. And um, one of the things that we're working on is trying to get a few projects in, um, in place that are gonna include things that mimic beaver activity, things like beaver dam analogs. Again, these are being used in the state. Some of you may be familiar with the work that's being done in Washington, Oregon, Utah, where they're using beaver dam analogs, which are basically people building pretend beaver dams, sort of, um, that are meant to rebuild stream channels. So they're using stream restoration and fish restoration techniques in, in those states. Um, because again, they can recapture sediment, rebuild, and bring back up the eroded channel bottoms and things like that. So trying to 
um, see if we can do some of those kinds of things. We aren't actually moving or touching any actual beavers because that's a very complex and additionally um, problematic is actually moving beavers, but rather just using the kind of the concepts of um, of understanding how beavers do work. Um, and hopefully maybe this year we'll get um, a, BD, a BDA in place. Um, there's a couple sort of um, <clears throat> post assisted log structures, which are a similar concept, but they basically only go partway across the channel and Trout Unlimited Canada has um, got some of those in, which you might hear about later from Angie. So you might, in, in my past experience, I've, I've run into a lot of folks who are quite avid um, anglers or quite avid um, people interested in fish in general who don't necessarily see beavers as being a benefit. Excuse me. And um, I think one of the really obvious reasons that beavers generally are beneficial um, is not only do they store a lot of water, which is cooler, colder and deeper, which is generally good for fish, but they help clean that water and the sediment trapping that they contribute um, means that water bodies are generally cleaner and um, and and that's one of the reasons that they're valuable for fish habitat. So that's just one example of some of the work we're doing um, on beaver related things. Um, I'm going to turn it over here in a second to Angie. So I'll ask her to um, to unmute herself and and um, she's going to talk some more about on the ground work that we've been doing um, from restoration to many other um, kinds of things. So I'll just um, let Angie, I think I have one more slide uh, there, Angie. And um, she's gonna talk about some of the on the ground things we've been doing. Do you have control? Is it working for you, Angie? I believe so, unless I, yeah, I think I just switched it. Okay. Hi, I'm Angie Quist, as Noreen mentioned. I am based out of Rocky Mountain House. I'm a riparian specialist that was hired there. Um, Oh, can we go back? That might have been me. Sorry. I was hired on as part of the Eastern Slopes uh, Eastern Slopes funding to assist with some of the work in the area. And so I'll be kind of illustrating some of the work that we've done in the community. One of the main projects, or the first projects I even worked on, was the Tay River collaborative, collaborative effort on bringing back bull trout. And this was um, an effort that we've been doing over the last three years. And it started off with Toronto Limited Canada and Alberta Environment Parks. And it's kind of grown into, um, into something bigger with the county and the University of Calgary, as well as the Rocky ATV Society has done some work to help us with that effort as well. I'm not sure how to go forward. Oh, there we go. So as part of the collaborative effort, cows and fish. Noreen, I'm not quite sure if this is working. Maybe I'll just get you to take control and go back a slide. Yeah, so we, we, what we did is we've completed seven riparian health inventories on the Tay River watershed. Five of those which were on public land and two of those were on private land. And six of those riparian health inventories, the riparian areas were healthy and one was unhealthy as you can see in the bottom right corner. And we are currently working with that landowner to find better solutions to have the cows cross the creek. This is the area where the cows mainly cross and water from the creek. So we've been working on installing an offsite watering system there and fencing off the area and finding alternative solutions for crossing. But as you can see, two of those photos there were from private land and two of those photos were from pu public land. So overall, the Tay River watershed is has a healthy riparian health. Marie, can you go to the next slide? Some of the work we've done on the Tay River that we've assisted with includes stream bank restoration. And that's been a collaborative, collaborative effort 
on both public and private land. So we had a work fee day with Clearwater County on private land with a landowner who was concerned about the stream bank eroding away and getting too close to his fence as he had just recently fenced off his livestock from the creek and wanted to stabilize the bank. So we did some willow staking there and that was last year. And then this year we worked with the Rocky TV Society on public land where we went to a spot that the trail was reclaimed with rough and loose and the Rocky TV Society helped, in, helped with some willow staking and install some live smiles as well. And as you can see, um, they're both, there was quite a few people and there was quite a lot of interest in that as well from the Rocky TV Society. They were very excited to be working with this as a collaborative effort. And Noreen, do you want to go to the next one? And you can see in the bottom left hand corner, that's the Rocky TV Society there using the Alberta Watercourse Crossing Inventory app that was released by FRI. And we went across a, we traveled along a pipeline and we inventoried about seven crossings that needed to be addressed along the Tay River watershed. And you can see that there's a, a culvert that's not very useful in that photo there, as well as Trout Unlimited Canada and myself went out into various parts and to, to do on the ground work with the ready model. And we assessed certain points and sent that information to Michael Wagner for him to, to verify on the ground aspects of his model and then also use that information to determine to target, target areas for restoration within the watershed. Noreen, can you go next? And some of the work we've done includes Radiant Creek. So Radiant Creek has also been a collaborative, collaborative effort on bringing back bull trout. And it's an effort with Trout Unlimited Canada, Cows and Fish, Alberta Environment and Parks, and Clearwater County. If you go to this area is being utilized by cattle. It's on the within the forest reserve. And there's lots of impacts from cattle, wild horses, and from recreation use within the area and part of the stream has been blown out just from that bridge there downstream. Increased velocity and this caused some major issues. Noreen, can you go next? So we completed two riparian health inventories on Radiant Creek. We completed one um, just above, the, above the, the bridge there and one below the bridge. And the, prop, the restoration area is below the bridge since that has the most impacts from being blown out from the bridge and lots of cattle and livestock and um, human recreation in the area. And then above the bridge, we use that as a reference site to see how um, the project spans over the five years that it's going to be up for. And you can kind of see in the photos there that the channel is, has become incised and there's not a whole lot of vegetation on the majority of the area. In Radiant Creek, both both um, riparian health inventories came back as healthy, but with problems. Maureen, do you want to go next? So the riparian and stream restoration work that we've been doing on Radiant Creek started off with um, willow staking. We did uh, some volunteer days and we willow staked along the creek and along some of the crossings which afterwards the area was fenced off with panel fencing. And then, so that was last year. And then this year, Trout Unlimited Canada, with the help of Cows and Fish and Clearwater County as well, installed some post assisted log structures, as you can see there. So the one with, that's the group photo shows a post assisted log structure coming out from the side of the channel in hopes to divert the water around. And then next to it is a post-assisted log structure within the channel to help. And both of these, there were a, quite a few of them placed within the stream and they're hopefully going to um, basically divert the water around and increase meandering because the stream has straightened out. And as you noticed from um, Noreen's presentation earlier back, how she showed 
the two photos with the cars, how the straight stream increases velocity, increases erosion of the channel, and doesn't allow for the water to infiltrate into the ground. Noreen, next. And as mentioned earlier, we, um, we did some riparian health inventories on Dog Pound Creek and some more on the ground work has been done there as well. This is a collaborative effort with Child Unlimited Canada, Cows and Fish and Alberta Conservation Association. Can you go next, Noreen? So we don't have any of the results from these riparian health inventories yet since they were done this year and the reports are going to be written up this winter. But as you can see, we have some um, before, like we have some photos through the years, starting in 2004, some photos from last year in 2020, and photos again this year from 2021. The fence was pulled back in 2020, and this and the cows were allowed in there this year just to clear up some swath on the inside. So there's not a huge difference in health from the last two years but hopefully we can come back in a couple of years and we can see what kind of changes have occurred. But you can see from 2004 to 2001, it's already looking healthier. One thing we did notice about this area of the dog pound is that there has not been a whole lot of willow regeneration. And there's been some speculation just maybe with the soil types that it, it, the willows aren't coming back as quickly as in other areas. So even though we've fenced off and excluded the cattle from this area of the creek, we're not seeing that woody species regeneration. Marian, can you go next? Another effort that we've been doing is the North Raven River. We were, this was brought to our attention this year by um, Alberta Environment and Parks. The rangeland agrologist is hoping to address some of the impacts on the North Raven River there. And so with this, we've been chatting with Alberta Conservation Association as well. And recently we've had some grazing lease holders um, come to us with funding from Forest Resource Improvement Association of Alberta. So they would also like to um, add into the efforts. And I'll show you just in a sec if we go forward. So again, whenever we do projects on the ground, we like to do a riparian health inventory. This helps us capture the health of the system prior to the project going in. And if we can't get in prior to the project, then immediately after the project goes in so that we know what the health is like, and then hopefully come back a couple of years later to see how the project is changing the area, hopefully for the better. Um, this is our field crew, just doing some notes at the end of the day on the North Raven River after the riparian health inventory. And then you can see some photos on the bottom there that show uh, one of the crossings for the for the the North Raven River that has some severe impact and we're hoping to address that. But if you look on the inside of the creek there, the creek is fenced off and excluded from the cattle with the exception of the crossing and you can see it's very healthy, has a lot of woody species. And then if you look where the cattle access can access it, it's a little muddied up and a lot of sedimentation is going into the river from those access points. Marion, if you go forward. So two of the management changes that we are hoping to implement on the North Raven River include excluding the cattle from those crossings as those crossings are severely impacted and to install offsite watering systems so that they don't need to access the area for watering and it's only used to cross them once or twice throughout the summer. And then also you can see, well, maybe not so much see the fence, but there is a fence there. And we are hoping to pull that fence back at least a meter, um, sometimes um, in some areas more where it's getting really close to the creek. So, and to have that maintained and mowed, um, the, the agrologist is working with both the grazing lease holders and with Alberta Conservation Association for shared responsibility to keep the fence line mowed on the inside so that the vegetation doesn't, one, start pushing out the fence and causing issues with, with the fence and allowing wildlife to not just immediately get run into a fence, but also for the anglers to be able to walk along the fence line so that they're not 
having to walk through the grazing lease and and have to like trudge through some thick bush because that area there has a lot of a lot of willows. Marion, can you go forward? And yeah, that would be it for on the ground projects that are going on within North Central Alberta. Thanks, Angie. And and the the first dog pound property that Angie talked about too is the one that Northern Lights has fly fishers that have contributed financially to. So um, you guys helped with some of those costs. I'm sure some of you know that, but just to, to point that out as well. So um, as Angie said, the, the health results, although we did the field work, it takes a long time because we do over two, we did over 200 sites this year. So it takes a little while to actually summarize all of the work and get reports done. So that'll be later this year. Um, we are of course doing work in other places all over Alberta, some of the things that I talked about, but um, we just picked a few sites that we thought were most relevant and specific for your guys's interest to, to talk about um, and i would say it's um, really um, great to see these sort of on the ground projects and the collaboration um, you guys and others that are helping make them possible right not only financially but sort of supporting the the concept and the idea and and just like the on the ground stuff the they require you know involvement and interest and um, so we're always here we basically go where we're invited and that includes both the on the ground work as well as presentations or awareness or any of the work we do so if you're interested in having us involved in something and you know anywhere of course just, just let us know and we'll do our best to be to be part of it um, and part of that sort of um, voluntary aspect is really important because it, it creates a local community involvement and investment and interest and that's what we're trying to always encourage is um, we, we know that we uh, as an organization can't be everywhere and we're truly trying to encourage longevity and so the sort of local community ownership and I, you know, I consider you guys a community of people who are anglers really committed to conservation and so that's a really important part of the work we do is, is really just supporting those efforts not um, doing them on behalf of other people just like the work we do with landowners we're helping them we're not doing it for them because um, we know we can't be there always into the future so it needs to be something that really works for them um, as and, and that they can follow through on in when we're not there so part of that is monitoring and Angie talked about riparian health which is just ecological or environmental monitoring but we also do um, as I mentioned sort of program and social types of evaluation and in um, in 20, uh, whoops, sorry, I can't seem to get my little the block at the top to move. So you may be not seeing this whole image, but in every year we do riparian health work and, and 150 to 200 sites. And we have, a, and some of those are always revisits going back to the same sites as well as many, many new sites every year. And so in the last, you know, 25 years, we've visited over 3000 sites and this pie chart um, is one of our ways of continuing to look at the overall health of all the sites we've looked at across Alberta and trying to you know, increase that piece of the pie that's green, the healthy piece and make that reddish piece, which is the unhealthy piece, hopefully get smaller over time. And, and what we have seen over the years is definitely, is definitely that, um, that it used to be very much, you know, only maybe at most 25% of the pie was green and, and the same amount was unhealthy and that, you know, the other half is that sort of middle of the road piece. Um, and we are starting to see um, that start to change with enough revisits of sites that we've been to, um, we're starting to change that. It takes a lot of sites when you're looking at thousands of sites to start to see that change. But I'll give you a couple, just an example of one site um, which is in the southern foothills, actually, um, a site that we have monitored for quite a long time. Um, and you can see in 2000, which is one of the very early years we were doing repair and health work, um, the site was very unhealthy in the top left there and it scored 30%. Um, so a lot of bare ground, weeds, very few trees and shrubs along the edges where it needed to be. Um, and the management was to basically just change the grazing, not to get rid of cows entirely, but to remove winter grazing, which is um, that what was happening, the cows are kind of hanging out um, and removing all the small understory, the trees and the small trees and the shrubs were missing, leading to a lot of bare ground. So as of 
2004 that they removed all winter grazing and in 2009 they just generally reduced their overall stocking rate so you can see that over time there's lots of willows coming in and poplars um, and generally vegetation re recolonizing and, and filling the, the place back in and um, in you know just over a decade it had al already reached healthy and I think this is a good example to from an agricultural site to show it takes time um, sometimes sites aren't going to heal in 10 years they might have got to where they are in 100 years of land use right so it can take a long time and some sites heal more quickly than others this is a very gravelly site as you can see so that's one thing in its favor in the sense that there's not a lot of soil compaction compared to places that have a lot of soft moist soils um, that compaction is really hard to undo the other thing I, I talked about doing was um, sort of the social science so uh, this was a question that was posed a quite a few years ago when we did the mis magic and mystery of fish survey and Trout Unlimited Canada helped us deliver this as, along with a bunch of other organizations shared it with their um, contacts and we had a whole bunch of questions to get a sense of what do people know about fish fish habitat and re the relationship to riparian areas and one of the sections was true false questions and this was one you know true or false native fish have been very successful at adapting quickly to habitat changes we have made the correct answer is false, as in native fish do not adapt quickly. That's not how evolution works, obviously. Um, but only 58% of people, that left column there, 58% of people got that right. Everybody else either said they didn't know or they answered that it was true, that fish adapt quickly. And so, um, you know, part of uh, the work I know you guys do a lot of education and conservation information sharing and training and knowledge um, with people. It's it's you know helping people understand that you know that that's not how evolution happens. That's not how um, conservation happens. So I encourage you guys to keep doing that kind of thing because there's obviously an ongoing need for for people to understand how fish and riparian actually work. And a lot of the challenges are because we live in a diverse multi land use landscape from recreation to grazing to roads to industry. And a lot of things are happening in a lot of places all at the same time or in many places. And it's a challenge to obviously um, find ways to make that land use sustainable and um, keep our landscape healthy. Um, I don't, you've seen some really great success stories, hopefully in what Angie and I talked about, but it's it's not always as easy as 30 pounds for $30 in 30 days. It's a little bit more work than that probably. Um, and the key principle I think we try and operate under is to, is to really acknowledge the importance that landowners and land users, including anglers, play in decisions and actions that determine the health of the riparian area, the health of the landscape as a whole, and how um, it provide our landscape and our water provides ecological goods and services. So, um, so I encourage you guys to, to continue to do the great work. It's, it's awesome to see so many um, keen folks as part of your membership. Um, I just want to acknowledge our um, cows and fish uh, members are like a nonprofit. We have any nonprofit. We have a board of directors, and our membership is actually made up of organizations primarily. And these are the organizations that support our work, in addition to many individual grants that we have. Um, so, if you're interested, of course, you can reach out to uh, uh, to myself or Angie. Um, we do also have staff based in Edmonton, um, Red Deer. Calgary, Airdrie, and Lethbridge. So um, of course, feel free and their contact is all on our website. So I think we were gonna do one more poll, which Ken is gonna bring up. So please answer the poll. And then once most people have answered it, Ken will close it. That's just about everybody. Great. Good. Good to see that there's there was a um, there was less information learned. That wasn't I wasn't all old hat for all of you. That's great news. Thank you, Ken, for putting that up and getting those prepared. Um, so yeah, so I think what we would love to do now is take some time for for questions if anybody's interested and has has questions or comments.
So thank you. Thanks very much, Noreen. I thought it was a, quite an interesting presentation. I learned a lot. Uh, I did have a question. Uh, when you're going through the uh, the scoring and, and the repairing assessment and the elements of it, there was one uh, that kind of caught my eye. It was a human human caused uh, uh, damage to the rest of the site. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the picture there was uh, ATV trails and so on. Um, it was only a score of out of three, so that seemed to me that that uh, that was a pretty important one. Yet it was it was only uh, a, a cap of three. Could you could you talk to that? Yeah, that, that's a, a really good observation. You notice that the questions are all, uh, not, they're out of different amounts. They're weighted differently. So um, the reason that it's um, weighted less in the rest of the repairing area um, is because it's not at the interface with the water as part of the reason. So the bank question is actually weighted more heavily okay. because there's that's the direct interface between the water and the land and where more of those compaction issues and erosion issues are going to be um, more exacerbated more immediately because of the the, water, the the ongoing interaction with water as opposed to the occasional interaction with water. Um, I'd say that's the simplest answer. It's also um, because the, the physical impacts are, again, mostly about compaction and soil and topographic changes. Um, and though they're, they are absolutely important, I don't want to suggest they're not important, um, they are also interrelated with bare ground and vegetation. And so some of those other impacts are going to get covered if there's no vegetation or there's bare ground as so well. A site, so a site that's got uh, the ATV damage or the trails that are, that are upstream uh, is likely to have other damage or other elements that, that come into play in the assessment. Right. The yeah. other parameters will very likely also potentially lose marks. So it is for a different aspect, but um, often there those aspects are kind of on top of one another. So we don't want to double count, but right. we do want, yeah. So so that is definitely really common that you'll have, if you have severe alterations, you usually have bare ground, you usually have lack of vegetation. Yeah. So yeah. All right. Yeah, that's a good question. I'll ask you, Noreen, about the riprap. You indicated it's not that successful. Is there an opportunity to put willows in the riprap? Yeah, actually, there's more and more, um, I would say, engineering aspects that are starting to include bioengineering within them. So more and more um, sort of intermingling of the two techniques, um, bioengineering being using only living or live material, which would be like willow plantings, like Angie talked about. Um, a lot of the engineering kind of stuff you, you see now is they're trying to um, unhard or deharden it a bit, so add a bit of natural elements within it. So they might be burying a layer of willow stakes, for instance, with material geotextile on top soil, and then a, a layer of rock or something like there's a whole host of techniques that are being used now where they're inter kind of interused. Um, now, of course, willows take a long time to establish and actually be big enough to do it. So you still need to protect infrastructure, which is where riprap is used most of the time, right, is to protect bridges and roads and things like that, because it's instantaneous. As soon as you put the rock there, there's some, some protection. Um, so um, whereas willows might take a long time to grow, even if they're really good at what they do, they aren't big trees right away. So um, yeah, so I think, but there is a growing recognition that at least in the non-engineering community, that that <laughs> that that, that, that um, riprap does tend to fail by itself, and it doesn't. It also speeds up the water. It creates more erosion downstream, which seems counterintuitive, but it's because it's relatively smooth surfaced. It's hard. It's not creating lots of friction compared to what plants and roots would. Right. Um, it doesn't provide habitat. It has so many other reasons. It's also not great. Um, but it's instantaneous protection. It may fail, but you also can't let your bridge or railroad wash away. So, um, but I think um, it's good to see that more willow use and things like that is being incorporated even within it. Yep. Does that answer your question, Bill? Yeah. I got more, nobody else does. Do you guys have to do any fundraising outside of uh, 
your sponsors? Yeah, pretty much all of our funding is grant based. So um, the organizations that I showed are actually, although some of them may also have grant programs, the fact that they're on the board is not related to their funding necessarily. Um, so we are, unlike say some organizations that do um, like active fundraising from events or membership fees or whatever that might look like, um, ours is, our funding is primarily grants. Um, pretty much exclusively. We, we get a few donations. We are a charity, but in the big scheme of things, um, that's a, it's a very small part of our, our resources. And we do rely on in-kind support from some of our members' organizations for some, like our offices, for instance, are provided uh, in-kind um, in, in other organization spaces, which is really significant. Hi, Noreen. Also, Peter. Um, you got another question, Bill? You go ahead. No, go ahead. I got a list of them, okay. but you go have a turn. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Noreen, our, our situation is pretty much the same. We rely largely on grants. And I guess, first of all, I just want to thank you, uh, and Cows and Fish, for your involvement on uh, on the Dog Pound on Maida Ranches. And this year on the lease property, it was, uh, I, I think, your your willingness to do that work was quite instrumental in the um, in getting the ACA grants committee to give us the money to pay for the fences and the watering system. So thank you for that. Um, it's all about it, working together to get it done. So <laughs> yeah. That's all good. It's all good. <laughs> no, I just had a question too. Going back to something you showed earlier, the um, Alberta native trout country. And, and, the, and the organizations involved in that. And it, it surprised me, not because of who's involved, but because of who isn't. Do you have any, any idea why, for example, Alberta Fish and Game or the Canadian Wildlife Federation would not be involved in that? Yeah, I, I can totally answer that. Um, basically, the organizations that are on the official group list of the Native Trout Collaborative are those that are splitting this grant that we have. So um, four years ago now, three years ago-ish, um, the federal government through Department of Fisheries and Oceans um, basically had a grant program, which is the um, it's a, a, related to aquatic species at risk. And they were looking to do significant grants per province. Essentially one per province was their preferred approach. And um, they were looking for large collaboratives of provincial organizations that were doing on mostly on the groundwork specific with native trout. Um, and so that led to Alberta Environment and Parks um, in Alberta, obviously the government department and the other organizations saying, well, if Alberta Environment and Parks will, took the lead, took, became the, the lead organization to apply on all of our behalf. Um, and that's basically what happened is we each said, well, we are doing things on the ground that will benefit. Um, in this case, it was meant to benefit West Slope Cutthroat Trout and Bull Trout specifically, primarily. Um, and um, it does include other aspects. So there's the education and component and mo some monitoring and things like that, but it's meant to basically address some of the things that are in the recovery strategies. So the on the ground needs, um, and those organizations were basically um, either familiar and already working on those kind of things together. Um, and, and and I can't really that that's the best I can answer it, I guess. Um, okay. And so we are one of those organizations that's um, working together with those grant funds. Okay, no, that I understand. Thanks. Noreen, uh, from watching a couple of your webinars, I got the feeling there was an issue with the cattle crossing the dog pound from one pasture to the other, and the bridge solution wasn't available. Did you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know if Angie, you can feel free to jump in here too. I think um, one of the issues is that a lot of the, like I'll say an elevated crossing kind of bridge approach, um, if it's a really a bridge bridge is hugely expensive um, for the economics, it doesn't necessarily make sense. A lot of these streams and the dog pound, at least in some areas is 
is a, an example of that or the raven in the north raven in some areas they're really um flattish and wide so the channel has widened potentially and the banks are not it's not it's not like there is a lot of height so you have a lot of width and not a lot of distance between the top of the bank and where the water would be and so bridges or elevated crossings of whatever structure it's going to be are going to be highly prone to washing out um yeah. Because you just like if you're if you're building a road bridge, think that you know that's why they build huge spans, right? So they get far enough away and high enough. And if you can't do that, then say in a cattle crossing setting, you know the, the cost of getting high enough and far enough away, it's like you know hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially for big. It's like it becomes a big bridge. Um, so that's one of the issues um, with a lot of these streams. If you have like some more foothills streams where you have a lot more. Um, you got maybe got a lot more height between the high, you got some high banks or in, in certain locations you have high banks and the water's way below it um then the maybe the crossing is not as prone to washing out um but that's one of the issues with using elevated crossings it's a great idea it's you know it keeps things out of the water obviously right but the problem is building them big enough far enough back that they're not going to wash away with every spring flood event or even more the more significant events so um yeah that and that's true of not just the dog pound but li like lots of places we're definitely trying to work with to encourage more of it um and there are folks that are using them where they can but again it's getting the span and the height in a place that doesn't wash out okay yeah so. yeah and just to add on that it Definitely we're seeing like an issue with the cost and then even just the frequency that the cows cross, cross over to, is it always, um, does it make sense to do that higher cost if the cows are only crossing over once or twice a year or if, versus just um, year round crossing use. So mm -hmm. it, it really depends on how the landowners are managing the crossing as well. Yeah, for sure. Thanks Angie. And there's a couple um, projects that we've been involved with on um, like on the Beaver Lodge. So further north, that was one of the other questions earlier. <clears throat> and and um, the Mighty Peace has led those projects in um, northern Sunrise County. And the other issue is cows don't like to cross these things because they feel scary and unsafe. And so even if they, they have to literally build sides on them and they have to block view and they have to put stuff on the flat deck part so that it's sounds not scary and then that stuff which is typically going to be straw is going to fall into the creek so there's you know it's better than crossing through the creek presumably but they're they're not an easy solution always it, it would be nice if they were um it would be nice if they were and on the um on the leased property too on the dog pound i i, I think uh, even with a bridge you'd there would still be the cost of, uh, of you still need to have fencing and an alternate watering system in place too, I think. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that, you know, I think you guys recognize the, the value of putting offsite watering and fencing in is even if you don't put fencing in and you don't put a bridge in, if you can put an offsite water of some kind in, right. 80% of the time, the cattle are going to be drinking from the trough, even if there's no fencing, because they prefer to. It's easy yeah. to get to. It's usually put in a good place. It's got easy footing. The water's cleaner. Um, cows like that too, right? So um, offsite watering systems can be really valuable, but not when they're put right on the stream bank. Obviously, you want to put them as far back as you can get them, of course. So. One other quick question, if you would, um, not directly related, I guess, to riparian protection, but um, one of the things we've experienced is resistance on the part of some landowners to installing wildlife friendly fencing. Do you have a good feel for why that is? Yeah. Um... Uh, Angie, you can comment on landowners that you've interacted with, but I'll, and I can also comment on those that I have. Do you have a, do you want to jump in or do you want me to go? I, I don't know. With the landowners I've talked to, they're pretty open to the idea of wildlife friendly fences. I haven't come across too many. The only time um, they're less inclined to is if they already have the materials that they're using. So, for example, barbed wire instead of smooth wire. 
or potentially um, worried that the fence is going to be too low for, to keep their cattle in or livestock in or too high to keep the calves in on the bottom strand. Yeah, I'd say that that's the main reason is they like in addition to the having material on hand that they want to use already because that's a lot less expensive than buying new stuff is is the concern with it not working that the fence isn't going to keep the cows in when it needs to and some of that's justified um, because different places have different needs in terms of um, you know their herds are maybe I'll say more respectful of the fence versus others and some of that is um, familiarity like it's hard to try something new like you wouldn't normally build your fence as low maybe and you know if anything I've seen over the last 20 years people are building their the normal fence it used to be three strand barbed wire now it's four strand barbed wire everyone's like well why did that change in the last 20 years it worked for 50 years and more and more people are going to four strand barbed wire in in their general fencing right and um and I I, I'm not really sure why that tendency just becomes what's the norm, right? With the expectation. And I think there's no doubt that it keeps more cows in for sure. Cause it's very hard, but they're also hard to get back in <laughs> and it's definitely yeah. not as wildlife friendly. Um, and I think once people are used to doing something, it's also just hard. It's hard to change, you know, change, change is difficult for all of us um, when you're used to something and it's hard to try something new because you don't know if it'll work and it might not, it might, it might tend to let more cows and calves out, um, yeah. which you don't want. I kind of trying to adjust to Zoom after in-person meetings. It's a little tough. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it. This is the you know more. You know the flip side of that is more and more people are going to electric fence, which is temporary, one strand, two strands at most, mm -hmm. which is definitely wildlife friendly. Um, especially it's not even up all the time. It's sometimes just up while the cattle are in, you know, I think yeah. the, that wave is growing so fast um, that that's, you know, that then sense of familiarity and success spreads too, um, which is, a, which will be a good thing for wildlife friendly fencing overall, for sure. That's good to know. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, we've had quite the uptake of projects that are involving portable electric fences. And one of the benefits too, is you can adjust the fence line really easily based on the conditions of that year. Yeah. Some guys use it around their tent when they're camping. <laughs> yeah, keep the bears out <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> okay, one more for me and I won't, won't bug you anymore. Lodgepole Creek, I understand was pretty short of grayling at one time. Uh, how did that turn out? Um, did you say lodge pole? Do you mean beaver lodge? Or beaver lodge, sorry, yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Um, so <laughs> we obviously question. didn't, yeah, we didn't, we, we of course haven't directly done any fish sampling ourselves, but the ACA was responsible, I believe, for doing the fish stuff. Um, and Carrie O'Shaughnessy, who's our staff member in Edmonton, has been involved in this project. So at the moment, um, fish are still not back in most of the beaver lodge, but there has been a huge effort um, to improve habitat, um, repairing projects of all kinds along the Beaver Lodge, um, the, the fish, um, the weir structure at Beaver Lodge, the town, um, has gone through a number of modifications because it was seen, it was a barrier. Um, it, there was a couple versions of fish ladders which weren't working and then they built a, I can't remember the exact term, Carrie could answer this more quickly than me, basically a long ramp structure that allows fish to just move through the channel. So they just changed the whole channel bed shape so that it's just a long gradual ramp instead of a weir. Um, and um, the last I heard as of like a year ago, they, you know, the, the grayling were not back there, but the habitat is improving. And that was one of the reasons that they are missing is because the habitat quality is not there. Now they, the numbers are still down, of course. Um, it's, I, I can't really say how long that's going to be? I, I don't I don't know the answer to that. But as of last year, they still I believe because we did a video with with um, the ACA folks involved, uh, they weren't back yet. But now there's more opportunity for them to be there because the habitat's better. Yep. Yeah.
Okay, I think that just about uh, sounds like it does it for questions. Um, uh, Noreen and Angie, I'd like to thank you very much for coming out and joining us tonight. Uh, it's been a very informative uh, presentation. There wasn't a huge crowd, but uh, we'll get those up on the YouTube channel and uh, hopefully get it a little bit more widespread. Uh, thank you very yeah. much. It was a great presentation. Thank you guys very much for the invitation and glad we could be here. Thanks.